<laughs> okay, I have a very, very short amount of time, but I have a lot of things I want to show you. How much is that there? Okay. Oh. So, yeah, I'm going to brush a little bit, but if I can't show you everything, then that's okay. Maybe I'll come back for another half an hour later. Uh, so, last time, what did we talk about? Materiality of books, how it evolved over time. We talked about different modes of reading. Uh, what else did we talk about? Content navigation, we talked about. Uh, I'm going to just do a brief recap. Uh, so, the title today is Design for Reading Typography as Interface. So, I would argue with this lecture that typography has always been for uh, navigating uh, is an interface between language and reader. Okay. We have, last time we talked about three different modes of reading. Receptive means immersing in the text. But okay, oh, 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 oh. okay. Okay. Receptive is where you immerse in a body of text, in a story usually. You read in a linear way, selective is when you select what's most relevant to you, find things strategically. For example, a textbook, fragmented reading is, if you imagine news, uh, news feeds, like in Facebook and uh, Twitter. So this is immersive or linear reading. This is selective or strategic reading. And this is fragmented reading. We talked about formats uh, uh, or the materiality, the constraints that has to do with that. We talked about constraints that came from production, constraints that, that came that comes from consumption. Uh, we talked about navigational elements, so this has to do a lot to do with typography. We talked about genres, remember? I had an exercise for you, but you probably haven't done it. But think about that. Uh, you can recognize the genre by not just the content, but also by the look of it, the access structure of it. Uh, you know this is a newspaper, you know this is a novel, because you know the pattern that you uh, find things or read things in these genres. So these are the things that contribute to genres. Uh, this is in the content of the structure, this is in the way you access the information. Uh, this is the constraint that has to do with the materiality of the genre. A combination of all three indicates the genre. Uh, so, from this uh, framework, I want to introduce you to something else this time. Uh, a possible process of reading. You need to choose what, what to read. You either read it immersively for sustained amounts of time, or you look something up uh, specifically, and then you read a small chunk of the information. And then in that process, you might want to annotate, that means adding notes to what you're reading, highlighting things, marking certain pages, extracting the content, or sharing it. So it doesn't matter whether it's print, it doesn't matter whether it's print or screen or whatever, you do all these things. So this is, of course, is receptive reading, immersive reading, this is more selective reading. So this is a process that people possibly take when they read something. Okay, so from the materiality last time we talked about, we need to be aware of the resolution. Okay, so uh, for example, a laptop screen is relatively low res, 72 DPI is pretty typical resolution from uh, print is much, much higher. So whether, whether it's HD or whatever, retina, we are still working with a much, much higher resolution for print. So that affects how you design things with typography. And format, so size and resolution, from a mobile device that's uh, maybe three and a half inches diagonal to a large format broadsheet newspaper. How do you shape the attention of the readers, very different for these different environments. When resolution is low, you can only display very few things at once. Now, you have to maximize the page or the screen 
more content rather than navigation. You cannot clutter the screen with navigation. So if you want to do navigation, you need to do hide and reveal or sliding handles or things like that to hide the stuff that people need to navigate between content. Uh, you need a very simple and uncluttered layout. So you can take a print newspaper and shrink it down to a three and a half diagonal mobile screen. It does not work, so you have to design specifically for that. So when it's high resolution, you can display many things at the same time. You can use areas and designate them for navigation purposes, right? You can designate areas for different content types. You can have a much more complex layout because you can hold it really close and it's very high resolution. And you can have multiple entry or exit points to the content, right? For example, a newspaper. So the way you make choices and the way you consume the content is very different because the resolution is different, because the size is different. Okay? So one size doesn't fit all. That's very important. Okay. Uh, I just did a li little uh, analysis. If you're working with desktop or laptop computer, your viewing distance is quite far. Like this is the distance that you're working at, right? When you're looking at a laptop. You, you don't do this, right? You don't hold it like this. You can't take it to bed with you, right? You're sitting at a desk, you're sitting uh, with a computer on your lap, maybe. You're working with a resolution of 72 to 227 dpi. If you think about this DPI, 227, even the printers, the very early laser printers, let's say in 1985, the very first laser printers, were 300 DPI. This is extremely low, especially when you're looking at so far, right? So things need to be bigger if you're designing for desktop or laptop computers. Yeah. Uh, physical dimensions. Uh, this here as well. Tablet, you can hold it closer. Mobile, you can hold it even closer. If we're looking at laser print, typically now it's 600 dpi to 1200 dpi. If you're looking at uh, uh, offset printed material, it's 2500 dpi. Look at how much higher the resolution is compared to this one. So you can have incredible detail with offset print or even laser print, but you cannot for the other media. You need to zoom in. You need to do other things if you want to look at things at a much, much more detailed way. Okay? So design always for your viewport, uh, viewports, for your substrates. Okay. Okay. So last time we talked about content navigation, right? This time we keep on looking at content, and from that point of view, we look at typography of how people access content. Okay. But we're going to look at content and access. So if you read a book, actually it's pretty linear. Uh, because the pages are organized in a very linear way, although the content structure might not be linear. So you look at one thing after another. So that's a linear sequential order. But in fact, you can pick up a book and flip to any page you want and jump between them. But the substrate itself, the materiality of this format, promotes a linear sequence, right? But more often than not, your, the structure of your content is a nested structure. It's hierarchical, right? That means you're grouping things into categories, from big categories to smaller subcategories, right? So there's a level, uh, there are levels of importance here, parents are, it's, uh, relationships, right? Most publications structure contents like that in a nested structure. Okay. So this is a linear structure. I'm showing you a linear structure right now with my slides. I can go back, right? But pretty much it's, it's linear. I control it. And if you have an outliner, you can organize your content in a hierarchical format. So you need to plan your content based on this kind of a hierarchical structure. So in a table of contents, that's how you see an overview of this nested structure usually. This one has a, a numerical hierarchical system code, the hierarchy, right? Uh, you it. Okay. Uh, I'll show you this first. What's the problem here? Huh? The, okay, the line spacing is too close, but we 
really, there's no way for the reader to uh, understand how to access this content, basically. That's why I said typography is an interface, right? There's no way for, for, for people to understand how I should approach this content, what I'm looking at, unless you go and read it from beginning to end. So it's a perception problem. People think that it looks very difficult to understand uh, or understanding what it's about before getting into the content. Findability reasons, it's very difficult to look for something. Comprehensibility, of course, is very difficult to understand. It. So you need to provide an access structure for your reader through typography. That's the most important aim before you talk about anything about the aesthetics of how the text looks. Okay. And you recognize what it is? So with a clear access structure, you can quickly pick up on what genre is this publication, how to read this, how to find things, how to understand something with a clear access structure. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, I need to go back. So basically, how do we read something? We don't read every detail. We try to scan an environment, to scan a page, and look for meaningful patterns. So with our fixations and movements, we move very quickly with our eyeballs. So, we scan things. So you need to provide signposts, for example, headings, for example, big images, for example, bold type, to help people access the content. Okay. Uh, okay. So alignment is a very good way to create a clear. You don't know where to start. You don't know how things are related. Just with very simple alignments, you understand the reading pattern. So that's why typology is an interface. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a different way of looking at grids. Uh, do you know Massimo Vianelli? American Italian designer, very kind of modern, uh, modernist kind of school of typography. So he designed this unit grid system, it's a 12 column grid, to unify all of the US National Parks publications. Uh, I'm not going to explain how this system works because I have a little way of looking at how grids work. Because the most important thing is not the grid itself, but how you use the grid to code uh, different kinds of content, to articulate the content structure. Okay. So let's look at a set of slides like I have today. It's a very simple structure. A grid really is using the space and designating different areas for different functions or different types of content. So in a very low resolution kind of a medium like a like the screen like the projector here. You know I have a structure that's quite simple. I've developed uh, there's a presentation a title, there's a content list, and that is called a title screen. And then I have a set of bullet points, you know I have these bullet points a title with an image. You know, these patterns are templates that you can use and they become a grid that's based on content. So really, you, have, you just need to have consistent alignment lines duplicated across the templates to give it consistency. So it's very, I think this is a very simple way to explain how a grid works. Uh, let's say you have a display panel or a poster. So I have a six column grid here. But how you use it is more important. So I designate that as the title area. Under that, I have a short introduction that helps people grasp the overview of uh, the poster very quickly. I have an image that attracts people's attention. I have a long space here for a timeline. And then I have uh, five units of information with a small image and a text, uh, text block. And then I have a sidebar. You know, that's how you use a grid. It's not about just fitting everything into the, into the grid and forget about it. It doesn't work like that. You need to designate areas for different purposes, for different types of content. Okay. Align the line again, right? To give it structure. Okay. Uh, and then something a little bit more complicated. Uh, a multi-page document. 
So you might want to set up another relationship like this, an image and a caption, image caption repeated, and then you have body text, and then on a single column you have notes. So setting up a structure and repeating it is very important in a multiple page document. Okay. So you have a line on lines again, like that, that's consistent. Uh, another way of handling images in the same publication, you might have a full read image like that, a caption in a small column. You might have a, an, an image that stands across the three columns but doesn't bleed, have a caption as well, and then body text like that. So you set up a system for yourself. Not for yourself. You set up a system for the content. Okay? That's how it should be done. For the content. Not just because it looks good. It would work if it's like that. Okay. Let's say you have a section divider that separates the chapters. You have a full bleak image that draws people's attention kind of as a transition into that, uh, that section. And you have a title, you have a section number, you have a product introduction, you have a content list. So, so uh, you know, this is a, a, a good way of looking at how to use it. Okay. Uh, margins are very important. Uh, if you have a, an equal you know, margin on all sides, this is usually too long uh, for the text because the text has to span across the page. You know, that kind of a margin is a lot more inviting to read already. You might want to separate them into two columns so the lines are shorter. But it might connote something. It might look like a scientific journal, for example, or a magazine or newsletter. You can have a main column with a sub column for supporting information, or subsidiary information like notes, assignments. And then uh, you have a uh, folio, that means page, page number, and a running, running foot as navigational devices. Okay. So that's using space to articulate content structure, yeah? So now, let's look a little bit closer at how you structure the textual content at the graphic hierarchy. Okay, I think this might be a very, the first time that you hear typography explain this one. You might ask, where's the typography? Where are the typefaces? This is typography. Okay, look at this now, all right. So for every publication, there's kind of like, I call the norm. That's the main argument of the publication, right? So mainly it's the called body text usually. So that's the kind of, uh, the normal pattern of reading. You have a main text, or you call it body text, or continuous text. Above that norm, you have elements that dominate over the norm that draws more attention than the norm. Below that, you have elements that are secondary to the norm. Okay? So the norm, as I said, is what you usually call continuous text or body text or main text. Things that dominate over the norm are usually titles or subheads, images, introductory text, full quotes, things that you draw attention to. And then subsidiary, secondary to the norm would be footnotes, captions, margin notes, page numbers, header, headers, and footers. So think of the structure like this. Okay. Let's see what it looks like, what it might look like. Okay. That's, that's the body text. That's the norm. Okay. That's the normal reading text. 10 point Georgia with 30 point letting. Do you, do you understand this terminology? I am come off that. Maybe a sub slash sub sama. Sub point for lower type. Sub sign point for the line spacing. What are you? 10 over 13. Uh, 10 on 13. What is 10 on 13? Uh, so that's normal text. If I, if I say, okay, this is the normal text, the body text. What's below it would be a smaller type. Let's say this is the caption of footnotes or whatever. And it's in 8 on 11. Okay. And then above that would be the dominant, uh, the stuff that dominates over the norm is a heading. As in, uh, uh, is a 20 point type of 25 point heading. Okay. So this is a possible structure like that. Of course, you might have other things. Right? I've introduced another element now. The 
these are the subheads. And then I, have, uh, I, I put the caption over to the smaller column. Okay. So I have a system going now. A head, this is the A head, top level heading. It's 20 over 25. I have B heads that are the same as the body text type, but it's old. And I've captured that smaller. Okay. Good solid hierarchy, a bit boring. It's not easy to scan things. It's reasonably okay, but it's, it could be a little bit monotonous. Let's try something else. This might be a little bit easier to read, yeah, to find things. So again, Tapoke's interface, you're starting to be able to access the information quite quickly. You say, oh, I want to read about cover, so I, you can just go, go there right away. Okay, so the whole bell, I'll introduce a little system on. So I've uh, used space to separate these elements so it's easier to understand the structure. I've used a fixed gap here between the A head and the first paragraph. Okay. So now I've added uh, a, hierarchical, a hierarchical numeric system to help people navigate the structure. Okay. It's, a short, it's a short document, it's not worth putting in a system like that. Uh, or uh, I, can, I can make the headings off to the side so that they can be scanned quickly, right? Or I can separate them with a line. So this kind of makes each short paragraph quite distinct from each other. Okay. We call them rules rather than lines. Or uh, I have something that's calling content off to the side. So if I have, if I don't have a lot of time, I can just pick up on a quick tip. So give these names, give, give these labels, so you, you can use typography to articulate the content. There's a meaning to do this. It's not just, oh, it looks nice, so I'm just putting something off the side. No, it helps people find things, read things, yeah. Uh, you can use sans serif for everything. It's all right, but it still reads quite well, okay. Uh, there, there's very little difference in terms of legibility or readability. People prefer to read serif type of Yelka, but it's easier. We say, that is a performance, okay? It's very hard to read for body text. The headache is fine, no problem. It's just as well. Some sensor typefaces work better than others for text. Uh, so now I've added a little level of heading. So this is 7.1, 7 7.1.2. 7 it's a C head now. A head, A head, B head, C head. So it's not too many levels because people get lost in the structure. Okay. So if I don't put the numbering system, is this clear enough for people to understand this is under this big heading? Okay. Try to make it more explicit rather than subtle. So now I have further differentiated the time to what you know. Either way, I'll handle it. Okay. So now it's even more clear, the structure. The navigation is even more clear if I call this out as an introductory paragraph. So your attention can be drawn to this. Without getting into further details, you can quickly understand, okay, this chapter is about making information accessible. Okay. Very strong differentiation. Okay, so that's content hierarchy articulated through the use of typography. The text. You have a regular paragraph. You have lists that are unordered or ordered, so that ordered list has a sequence. Unordered list doesn't have one, that are like bullets. And the table allows you to compare information in two axes. Okay, so these are very basic. Textual, textual configurations. Okay. I'm going to show you each one. So paragraphs, basically, it's a group of paragraph coherent ideas in a text block format. Okay. Here, the differentiation between the paragraphs are not clear. Okay. Because only a line break is used. Yeah. 
here is a little bit better, but it's quite subtle. Yeah. Just a first line indent. The first paragraph really doesn't need an indent because it's obvious that it's the first paragraph. So we don't need to have an indent there. Uh, instead of indents, you can have paragraph spaces. Uh, right here, there are blank lines, basically. But you can control the space, actually. This might be a little bit too big. Smaller, it's already enough, right? So there's a stronger separation if you have space between the paragraphs. But a single line space is usually too large. Again, you, you, know, you can use line rules to separate them, but they become very discreet from each other. You really separate them. There might be reasons why you want to do that. Yeah. Lists are enumerations of similar items. Don't put things that are unrelated in a list. Doesn't work like that. Similar things. <laughs> they should be parallel in meaning. Okay. Enumeration. Soldier again. Okay. Uh, the Ten Commandments. Okay. Uh, is an unordered list. Right here. It doesn't have any differentiation except there's a line break. With a bullet, it's easy to see that it is an enumeration of 10 items. If you have numbering, it means that there is an order to it. Okay. Of course, there, there's an order to this. All right. It doesn't look so nice with the 10 like that. So you can adjust these things so it's easier to navigate. Do you really need the dots? Not really. It works just as well because you have space. And if you align the numbers on the right, it's even easier to see. If you make the bold, it's even easier to access. Right? See how typography is an interface, right? See how, how typography is an interface? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, fire regulations. Not easy to see that this is a list because some of the items wrap around on two lines. So how do we make it clear as a list? We add space between the items, okay, a little bit better. Uh, we can add uh, bullets, but the lines are not aligned like that. It's a bit difficult to understand, so you have hanging indents that make it easier to understand. Uh, if you want to further differentiate, uh, so there's a space there. Uh, well, it's okay, you don't need capitals, but you know, this makes it a lot easier to understand at a glance. Square bullets, square bullets. Okay, tables. Comparisons show on two axes. You can compare things with the same criteria, the same set of criteria. Okay, so this is usually what people do in Microsoft Word. It looks terrible, you don't want to read it. The uh, Edward Tuff calls this uh, kind of like a data prison. The data is in prison in grid. Right? Centering makes it even worse. So aligning everything to the left already improves it. Adding more space, more clear space inside the cells make it easier. Uh, making the grid less apparent also helps because the grid is supposed to be only a guidance for you to understand the table. So do you really need the vertical lines? Not really, because the, lines, uh, the, the cells are already aligned. So the header is differentiated with uh, blue text. The lines are blue as well. If you only have one color to work with, this would be quite effective as well. If you want to use uh, vertical lines, that means you might want to kind of emphasize the vertical comparison a bit more than the horizontal. So these are ways to improve access to information through the use of typography. Uh, this is a data table. Uh, data table means uh, you have numerical data you can compare. So again, you know, you can do things like that. You can emphasize a certain column. Uh, you can emphasize the subheads. So a lot of consideration with these things that you think is just typing. It's not. You're a designer. These things have to be designed. 
And typography is a way to access the text through an interface of some sort. Okay. Captions. This is quite simple. Okay. Uh, too close to the, to the picture is supposed to show a relationship between the picture and the explanation. This is better. This is great. This is also possible. This is also okay. A caption is not title. Okay. All right. Ah, Kelly. My boss. Ah, my. Typographic decision. Oh, sorry. Consideration. Sorry. Ah, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll see you on section two. Okay. Fine, fine. All right. I don't know if I want to skip this. Can anybody do that? Say something. Skip. Show them the page. Show them the page. Okay. Display typography, the hit typography, and track it, and enter it, and for example, full cover. Uh, on, on the left, Lady Captain, Lady Dumps, I hear it. Lady Captain, I'm not something you're probably going to say, I'm not 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 going to 我哋上到誒五點半咯，因為今晚五點都有做咯。好嘅。OK， so OK， I don't want to make it too overwhelming for you guys because you you guys probably don't think about these things so much.、Uh, you guys probably are okay with these things. So you need to look closely at type. It's not just when you choose a typeface. It's not oh I like this. This looks cool. This this looks different. It's not about that. There are so many kind of intricate details that you have to look at. If you look at the inside shape of an O, see how the curve is kind of even like this. It's a perfect circle. This one changes from thin to thick. This one changes from thin to thick really dramatically. So these are the things that you look out for. I'm only showing you the O. I don't want to show you too many things, but. A very basic way to differentiate them is serif, yoke, sensor, yoke, display. Oh, this is、uh, I don't have a font. It's all right. It's a, another script anyway. Okay. Try to be careful when you use these things.、Uh, if you don't know how they work, then use something that doesn't look too crazy. Okay. These are fine. These are these are useful. Okay. So Paulina says you're in aesthetic terms. The ideal typeface for continuous prose can be described as one that is just interesting enough to impart some flavor without making itself the focus of the design. If you look at this typeface, you don't feel you're not at all. I was able to see it. This is Santa. Very unique typeface. It's not very obvious. It's not very obvious typeface, but it works really well. That's a useful typeface. It's beautiful. But it doesn't mean you have to. It has to shout at you for every sentence. You don't want that to happen. Which one is more legible? Mana lele? Lele? Is it accent? We are. I'm going. I'm going. Lele, you're going to be more legible. Yeah. So 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 you're going to be more legible. Uh, if you want to know more, you can buy this. It's fifteen dollars. I wrote this.、Uh, you can buy this. You guys can only buy it. It's offset printed now. Fifteen dollars. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to explain too much now. Okay. Which one is stronger? Obviously, this one is much much stronger.、Uh, this one is very delicate. So this one works at low resolution, at small sizes. This one doesn't. Yeah. This one's better. Uh, I already showed you this one.、Uh, these are not terribly good typefaces to, for reading because the shapes are too regular. High here, the shapes. Okay, this one is mostly vertical and very square. This one is very geometric. Be careful about these.、Uh, the body text is hard to read. Be careful about the I, the one, and the small letter L. Because sometimes they are very 
is distinguishable. Like Bill Sands, yeah, exactly the same. So this one, obviously the sand, this works quite well. But sometimes you really need that to be perfectly clear for the reader. Maybe other times you don't. Um, I probably don't want to say too much about this, just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So double story G, double story, story G, you know. This one is better for text, these and on. So I've got to say the point size, exactly, jump to When we're talking about the point size of the typeface, we are measuring from the bottom of the D center to the top of the A center. So there's space in between that we have to measure as well. So compared to the Chinese, the Chinese actually is always bigger because it fits much fuller in a square, right? So uh, if you have two different typefaces set the same point size, they look like different sizes because the X heights are different. Yeah. You guys, are, you guys already know this is too basic for me. Yeah. So if you want to make typefaces with different X height that look like they're the same size, you need to adjust, right? So to equalize them. So if you want to combine a typeface with another one, you need to adjust the point size for that smaller typeface to so it matches with the other typeface. Okay. Of the line type, yeah. To so adding space. So this is 14 point type with a 14 point letter. We call this set sort of 14 on 14. This is 14 on 20. Ah, oh, it's not 16 on 20. Okay. So very tight, very hard to read. This is quite good. This one. This is probably too loose. You don't read. You don't read the lines as a block of text. Bottom width, too wide. Very uncomfortable to read because by the time you get to the end of the line, you don't know where the beginning is. It's very difficult to hunt for the first word in the line. Be careful. If you keep the column width the same but increase the point size dramatically, then you know this is a pretty good line uh, line length. But the text would be incredibly big, right? Too narrow, this is obvious, one to three words per line. Uh, this is still a little bit narrow. If it's for a short bit of text or caption, that's okay. If you make the column the same width but make the type smaller, this is a little bit better. If you have a column with that that's this wide with a smaller type size, you can have more than one column of text. Yeah. But be careful not to do this. This doesn't belong to the same text flow. This looks like a sidebar maybe, not body text. Is this the body text? People don't understand it. Right? So a lot of people like doing this, oh this is this looks nice and creative and things like that, but people are lost. They cannot navigate the text. You can do that. Okay. Be careful about that. Uh, this is reasonable, and this is not too bad either. Okay. Matching typefaces, try to aim for contrast. Don't pick two typefaces that are too similar. It defeats the purpose of choosing two typefaces in the first place. So this is good, a sand, full sensor, the serif body text. Heavy slab serif with a lightweight sand serif, you know, this is good. For one, one family, a heavy one and a regular one, works quite well. Don't do things like that, because you don't even know if these are two different typefaces. No need. These are the same. Okay. These are good free fonts, then why not make good use of them? These you can download from Google fonts, these are really high quality open source ones. These are uh, Mac system or Adobe, these are Mac or PC. These are good faces to use. Uh, you want to use these? No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Never, never, never. No. <laughs> Look like ever. Dan, I don't know what you get for it. A screen, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not for print. You buy, yeah. <laughs> 要畀錢嘅,唔好以為免費啦,做好慘啲嘛啲人做做一套字體做好多年,跟住就冇錢收。你做咗我都唔會得啦。Just buy them. They are designers, you are designer. You should pay them. You should pay for the things. 跟住我哋有啲釘冇嗰啲嘢嘅。好快啦,不如。好。阿布神。
So I just mentioned about uh, who's we like to use Sanky Bob. Oh, you love boy or What's that? You like boy or Sanky Bob? Bottle of Zang. Ah, how about it? Ah, how about it? I 
就細嗰個 horizontal vertical， 但係而家未經過打直排嘅，其實有嘅，而家 CSS 都做到嘅打直排。咁就嗰陣時咧，同阿 Patty 咧，就跟住又揾做緊呢個，咁就 back 好啦。咁或者佢哋嚟食飯啦都。back 好就係個字典嚟嘅，最衰冇嗰啲舊嗰啲 screenshot 咧 ，Patty。有冇啲好貼啊？啱係可能有喎，舊啲 screenshot。咁又字典咧，你知咧個 content 就個 navigation 就非常嘅。咁就呢個就準備出嚟啦。我覺得麻麻都要準備出嚟，好似唔係好咩。咁俾啲又係啦，又係咁樣搞啦，成件事咁樣。咁咁字典有咩唔同咧？因為咧個字典咧裏邊就唔係話淨係得個 head head word， 跟住就一扎字唔係咯。我哋幫佢諗咧，就係裏邊嗰個 semantic structure 啊，唔係 semantic structure， 即係點咧？你個字，你可能係有譬如嗰個係 noun 定係 verb 定係嗰個嗰個叫咩啊？唔記得咗。個 definition 啊 ，example sentences 啊，其實裏邊嗰個 structure 個 definition 係好複雜嘅裏邊。咁個結構咧，我哋都諗埋出嚟㗎。當然要，點話一傾啦？咁啊，講咁多啦，你哋啊～多啦，跟住咧啲 stacks 啦，你睇下啲 stacks 啦，誒，啲 stacks 啦，咁就，呢成其實我頭先講個 semantic structure， OK， 個 dictionary 啊，有可以幾本唔同嘅 dictionary 擺埋同一個 definition， 譬如你 search 一個字，佢係將佢幾本唔同嘅 dictionary 係集合埋一齊 show 俾你睇嘅 definition。咁誒好多啦嚇，有誒 pronunciation 上面有一扎啦，注音啊、拼音啊、IPA 啊、誒普通話科目課文，跟住有三 file 啦，裏邊仲咁就呢啲嘢全部都要拍翻翻佢嘅 ，OK？ 咁但係每一個呢啲誒 content 嘅 structural 嘅 component 咧，要俾個 style 佢噶嘛 ，typographic style。但係如果唔係，你點知邊啲嘢用咩 typography 嘅 display 咧？咁嗰度就我都冇時間 explain 啦，已經睇下啦。咁啊，咁啊，收尾都俾咗 set CSS 俾佢嘅 ，CSS 嘅 style， 有 block 嘅 style 同埋 inline 嘅 style。啊，呢啲都我哋 CSS back 嚟嘅啫，其實。呢一集啦。因為佢佢最最重要就係佢有誒、呃、中文啦，有誒、呃、我話傳統嘅正體字同埋殘體字，跟<笑>住中文嘅拼音，拼音雖然用拉丁字，但係其實佢係中文嚟嘅嘛，係咁同英文。Source and Pro 啦，我哋嗰時已經開始用個 Open Source 嘅，最近 Open Source 方嚟㗎啦。我都誒呢啲 CSS 出出曬俾佢。誒、uh, 呢個唔係好。